Howdy, howdy, everybody. Um, this is Mike Mills with uh, Mike Mills Mortgage and Finance, and this is the Texas Real Estate and Finance Podcast. And today, um, I'm welcoming two people that are going to join me to uh, get on a topic that can get can seem a little in-depth. It can seem like a lot, but if you break it down to some bare essentials, it's really not that difficult to understand. And the reality is, is that you need to understand this. You need to understand the, ter- the concept of blockchain and the concepts of crypto and the concepts of NFTs and all of these things because it is impacting our life, whether you realize it or not, or whether you understand it or not, it is coming. The train is coming and you need to be ready. So to help me kind of sift through all the uh, all the pieces of this, I'm welcoming Debbie Hoffman and Eric Lappin to the podcast. Hello, guys. Hey, Mike. Hey, Mike. hey Debbie. How are y'all doing today? Good. How are Great. you? Y'all uh, getting, I don't know what the weather is like. I think you're, are you in South Carolina, Eric? Is that right? Charleston, yeah. Charleston. And then Debbie, you're on I'm the East Coast. Cleveland, Cle- yeah. Oh, Cleveland, Ohio. Oh, we have a, we actually have a branch in Ohio. Um, it's in uh, Cincinnati, I think. I'm not sure. But um, mm-hmm. well, here it's 108 degrees. So um, I'm inside in the air conditioner, but uh, everybody else outside is walking around melting on the asphalt. How are you well, guys feeling where you're at? Not melting today. It's actually pretty comfortable out here, which is which is rare. So uh, normally we be, we would be melting like you in Texas. But I think Debbie, did you move there because of Johnny Manziel about seven eight years ago? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm here because it's a lot better than being in Florida right now. So, oh yeah. man, yeah, I lived in Florida for a year, and that was not <laughs> funny that the humidity there will, will get. I didn't have to worry about my hair. You know that wasn't a problem, <laughs> but uh, I know that's a concern for the ladies out there. So, um, <laughs> all right. So I wanted to bring you guys on because um, you know this is. This whole topic related to blockchain, uh, you know, you got to throw crypto in there because people at least understand to some extent what that is, um, even though it's a you know negative term sometimes to some people. But uh, blockchain, crypto, NFTs, all the stuff related to you know Web three is another term that people still they have no idea what you're saying when right. you bring it up. But um, I wanted to bring y'all on because y'all been in this world for a long time, and you know you've been especially relative to everybody else's knowledge base on this. You've, you've experienced this and gone through different iterations of it and are, are up to date in how all this stuff works. But so I wanted to kind of, you know, nerd out a little bit with y'all because this is a topic I love and love to t- talk about. And, but also too, I wanted to help my audience, which is primarily real estate agents and mortgage yeah. professional professionals, investors, to help them understand what this what this technology is going to mean to our industry and how quickly it's coming and what you need to be ready for. So that way, when it does really trickle down to your day-to-day life, which not quite there in different aspects, but it's coming, um, you know, people are at least familiar and know what to expect. So before we kind of get into the weeds a little bit though, I do want everybody to kind of understand y'all's background. Some, you know, we have bios and whatnot, but I'd rather you explain it yourself. So Debbie, why don't you start first and um, tell us a little bit about, you know, what you do, how you got into this space and, you know, kind of go from there. Sure. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. So um, I, my background is I'm a lawyer and exec, an executive, and I've been in the mortgage industry my entire career, um, starting in commercial, moving into residential, and I'm also um, a board member and, and a professor. So started down this path really of blockchain uh, from, and background in real estate finance, because when I was first an attorney, I um, was doing uh, deals and we would go to these uh, the client site and we would find mortgages and notes and all the ancillary documents all over the place, many of which were missing. And yep. we would spend we would spend months on site trying to find these things. And so when I learned about blockchain in around 2016, it was an aha moment. And I said, this could fix so much of what I've seen in terms of the mortgage lending industry. And we can get more into that, but that's kind of the, the, the background. Okay. And then Eric, how about you, buddy? Yeah, I've been in the industry for uh, over 25 years with with a lot of that 15 years in the banking side. So um, risk um, worked for three banks uh, prior to the crash. So uh, anywhere from origination to servicing to capital markets, warehouse lending, um, as well as uh, correspondent lending, whole loan sales, uh, non-performing loan sales. And then fixed income. So when I was at Credit Suisse, really learned a ton about the back end of fixed income assets and really le- learning about that that back end of the business. And then after that, really focused more on the technology side, um, innovation, and, and got into the title insurance space, working for a couple of the large underwriters uh, on that side. And, you know, a couple roles of corporate emerging technology roles, as well as um, corporate development. So in those type of roles, 
I got to sit at a seat that would see anything from business development to strategy to consumer related to business related to marketplaces, exchanges, all of that. So it was very, very helpful. And then back in uh, 2012 is really where I got the, the, the interest in learning about you know, digital currencies and really learning about crypto and this asset that, you know, everyone was talking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and then starting to learn about those. Um, and, you know, and as we've seen in the iterations of all this types of stuff, there's two different ways to look at it, right? You've got blockchain for business uses, and then you have people that just merely look at crypto from an investment standpoint or right. some sort of betting, Really, right. is, yeah, there's, yeah. What's well, like gambling on stock market? Same thing. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's yeah. not any different. Yeah, uh, you know. it's, just, it's just a different marketplace. Um, so, Debbie, and, and I'm going to ask both of you this sure. uh, to some extent because I want to hear your answer on it. But um, so, just to establish, you know, not only we yeah. have been dealing with blockchain and and this technology for a while, but specifically related to real estate and mortgages, with both which both of you have extensive yeah. history, and so and that's yeah. really you know what I want to focus on, but. Before we can do that, you know, like I was telling you before we got on, um, the amount of conversations I have on a daily basis with people, and I even bring up uh, blockchain or crypto. Well, first off, when I say blockchain, very few people still blows my mind. It's 2023, and yeah. very, very few people still know what blockchain is. I, I get blinks back, like well, I've never heard that. <laughs> now, if I say yeah. crypto, then I get the oh yeah, okay, so yeah, you're yeah. one of those, you know. So there's there's that. Um, so if you were talking to a layman that came in and said, okay, tell me what is explain as simply as you can, what blockchain is specifically so we can help understand that a little bit. And then why you think that the, the understanding or adoption of it has had such a struggle for just the common person to be able to, to wrap their head around. Sure. So, you know, Mike, I didn't say properly my background that, so I ran a company, I started my own company in um, Symmetry Blockchain Advisors in 2017. And I literally toured the country teaching mortgage executives what blockchain and the difference was between that and um, crypto. And so just you asked the question and I just want the, your, your listeners to know they're if they don't know this, they're not alone. I mean, literally, I would go from, you know, I felt like I was on like the, you know, the tour. The, unfortunately, it wasn't a rock band tour, but it was a crypto <laughs> blockchain education tour. And so basically, the bottom line is blo blockchain is the protocol on which Bitcoin was originally built. And there are thousands of blockchain protocols, and there's only one Bitcoin block, blockchain protocol. And all the other cryptocurrencies that you hear, that you might hear out there, um, Ethereum is another one you might have heard of. They are all built on different blockchain protocols. So the most basic concept is that there, there are two different things. Crypto in blockchain, blockchain is a protocol. Crypto is a currency built on blockchain. OK, yep. so let's establish that. Why yep. hasn't it gone mainstream? Mostly, I would say because of the media and the news, it always is harping on the nefarious players in the crypto market. And so what people can't get beyond is even executives, honestly, like I've heard I've spoken to many, many, many mortgage executives and they can't get beyond the fact that there's this nefar these nefarious players who can potentially break into a blockchain or, a, you know, crypto and and make something bad happen. And there's right. so much more to it than that. But it's really the media and the name that gives blockchain kind of a bad name. It doesn't doesn't say all the amazing qualities that we can talk about that it can do for the mortgage industry. OK, so, Eric, how would you how would you answer that question, too? Very similar. I mean, the you know, it's you have what's called uh, it's a term that's been used for years, but uh, it's called TradFi, traditional finance, which is what we're all used to today, which is banking, uh, mortgage lending, consumer lending, any way that we do either payments or lending, the the, the transfer of money and, and underwriting risk and, and making those credit offers. It's called TradFi, traditional fi, uh, finance. Mm -hmm. And then you have what's called DeFi, decentralized finance. And there are ways that, especially in the United States, because of where our regulation is going and some of the recent um, determinations we've seen from the SEC, is there's a there's a test. It's called the Howey test, H-O-W-E-Y, that has four uh, four bullets prongs. to it, four prongs, that um, you either pass or fail it. And um, you know, to date, you're seeing that in the United States, for example. Um, a lot of these groups are are passing that, whereas Bitcoin is failing it, which is a good thing, meaning that it's not a security. It is a it is a distributed ledger technology with blockchain being part of a uh, of the, that digi distributed ledger technology piece. And the use for business use cases is becoming more and more apparent that the immutability of the data, the assignability, the transferability, 
the accuracy of the data can also be uh, amended by having anything that was put in the chain incorrectly and then have it put in correctly afterwards. So you have that audit trail. Yeah. So especially as we see in title insurance, um, you know, uh, you just want to make sure that you see the underlying asset and the proof of that ownership. And that can be utilized in a chain and then a tokens created of that, which makes it digital and easily transferable. So, um, well, I think it's one of those things where it it the it's it's funny to me or it's ironic that the the thing about blockchain that it's the most that adds the most benefit to these circumstances is the immutability or the security of it, right? Yeah. It is the fact that you can't go in and mess with it, right? It's yeah. it, it, it's it's it is once it's recorded, it's there. Um, you know, there are decentralized blockchains and there are centralized blockchains. There are blockchains that, that are private that companies are creating for themselves and which is maybe we can get into the whole idea of uh, the digital dollar and, and the, the you know, national or the uh, Fed trying to create their own uh, blockchain, which I'm not necessarily in favor of. But um, but there's but then the, the flip side of it is, is there's this expectation that it isn't safe, that because we've the, the digital age that we grow up in now where people hack your data and they get into your phone and they, you know, check your or you know run your credit or you're not run your credit but open up credit cards get into your bank yeah. whatever so it yeah. seems is so unsafe and yet the irony again is that no actually it is the most safe and that's mm -hmm. why we're trying to move in that direction so so debbie why do you think is is it just the media is that what you think it is or is there you know is it the legacy system that's been existing that's really pushing against it right now so mike it's a great question because so let's just take this from the beginning bitcoin was the first blockchain it was built in 2009 uh, by Satoshi Nakamoto. Nobody knows if that's a person entity thing, Nobody but anyway, knows. right. But anyway, um, it's come a long way. We've had um, so many, like I said, there's so many different blockchain protocols. So the first one um, and those thereafter, there's there's not so many security questions anymore with, with Bitcoin, but there are security questions on blockchains that are built. But the more that they are built, like any technology, the better we're getting at recognizing what the potential security breaches are. And if you look at the studies, most of the security breaches on these things are from the inside. So it's right. like any other kind of um, technology. And so you touched on all the amazing um, characteristics of it. And one of them is um, immutability. And there's other, this a lot of people don't understand, but it's transparency that you can actually yes. see who went in and who touched it and where did it, where, you know, who made a change on the ledger and, the original one, so people get confused because Bitcoin, you can't see exactly who went in. It's not, you, you, you can, can see, see wallets. You can see the, the hashes for the wallet. Right. But you right. can't see that. Like, it's not, it's not so that you can see like where that exactly is, or you, right. it's not as traceable. So the ones you're the federal seeing, government and then you can search IPs and they can find it. So you can still, you know, there they you can go. still get found. Yeah. 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 Good point. But I guess the, the thing I'm trying to say is that um, what people don't recognize is, is the characteristics and how long we've come from the original one and what is being changed. And, and another one on that point, Mike, I want to make sure people understand is we're going to, maybe we'll get into it, but is, is energy like the original one, the right. way, the way blockchains were built, took a lot of energy. The ones that are being built today, there's a much more conscious awareness of, that and it's not it's not the same kind of proof of basically to uh, put to add blocks to the chain to build so yeah taking... to build the blocks it, it doesn't it right. doesn't require the same output that it did and the technology the mining systems are getting better and more efficient and you know there was an issue right. with the chips and all that kind of stuff that was occurring during right. covid that caused all kinds of issues as well so yeah i mean it yeah. it is becoming more and more efficient eric do you so when we talk about real estate and mortgage specifically, what are you seeing are technologies that are currently like being utilized that are utilizing blockchain um, within the industry right now? And then, you know, is it starting to trickle down yet? We'll get into some of the stuff coming later, but how much is actually being currently put into play or, or that's being used today? Uh, in the mortgage industry, I'd still say it's very little. Okay. Um, in the United States, a lot of it's being done in the healthcare and energy space. Um, educational space is using it as well. Um, in the lending space, you are seeing some banks that are starting to adopt it. And you're also starting to see some of these consortiums come together where banks work with one another to create a stable coin. And what that means is it's it's basically using a means of, of a currency that is acceptable by all parties involved that's backed by some sort of an asset. And, yeah. and that asset is, is, is a viable asset. So when something is utilizing a fiat, you know, US dollar is a note, it's a right. fiat currency. 
And a lot of people don't realize that. But, you know, when you're when you're backed by the fiat the U.S. dollar, even though we've re recently downgraded it, there's still a lot of value to that. Some of the issues that we saw in the news in the last six to 12 months with some of the uh, companies involved in crypto that went out is they were backed by, you know, algorithms. There was nothing there to it. So there's definitely a big difference to those things. But in lending, I mean, we are seeing some of the some of the mortgage companies, you know, utilize the transfer of money from, from an escrow uh, up front that can be used as some sort of a cryptocurrency. They have underwriting guidelines on loan to values that can be useful for that, for assets. Um, and then there are companies in the servicing space too that, that we've spoken with that are looking at, uh, for the same reason that you just brought up earlier and Debbie talked about that whenever there's a data breach, that's because there's a centralized um, data um, yeah, Make everything's coming is. from one server. It's not spread coming across multiple. Yeah. It's not spread across one. So when you right. have a block in each one, they, that, that this group that would hack would have to go to each one of those to get all that information. So the yes. chances of that happening are, are very slim and nil compared to what we see in today's business. It's actually better. Um, we are seeing also right. in use cases with um, lenders that are also looking at utilizing uh, digital identification. So when you have the banking side of it up front, KYC, which is know your customer, KYB, know your business, BSA, Bank Secrecy Act, a lot of that starts on the front end when consumers yeah. are involved with getting relationships with businesses, that you're starting to see this digital identity that is also anchored to a chain, which is one of the things that we're working on as well um, for digital identity through a a qualified borrower medallion and we can okay. chat about that later but we're seeing yeah. we're seeing we're seeing some growth in that in the lending industry debbie what are you seeing from because you spend a lot of time on the education side obviously as a you know you're an attorney and a professor and um you're you're talking to people and i noticed you serve on a lot of boards and you know so you're heavily involved in the uh you know web3 community let's call it um what are you seeing or what kind of questions are you getting from from people out there related yeah. to this and where, where's the disconnect in understanding do you think so oh, the, there we go. <laughs> the um, the biggest question, the biggest question that I think so generally the the basic understanding, which I think has come a long way in the past two years. Um, uh, it used to be people just didn't understand it, but now it's definitely coming a long way. But one of the bigger misconceptions I think is probably now around um, tokenization and NFT, NFTs and where that can um, play into the blockchain itself. And I also think that people are focusing so much on the crypto and liquidity side and that is enough or not, especially in our industry, on the actual protocol and what blockchain as a ledger can do is blockchain. So I always start my conversations when people are Thing, well, you know, I really don't understand that it's, a, it's always about your supply chain and the uninterested parties that can be connected through this ledger that is open to you know everybody in the supply chain in a certain in a certain aspect. So I think to, again, it goes back. You asked me like, what are we seeing? It's it's still an understanding and use case. And you, you give Eric or I a use case um, that you think that um, you know like, what can, what can we do when when our in, in our particular where we play in the mortgage loaning space or in whatever, not some other space. And Eric and I could probably come back and be like, blockchain would be helpful here, but you might not want in certain scenarios. And in others, maybe. Gotcha. Sorry, you're, um, I, I'm not sure if it's my internet connection or yours, but you're kind of cutting in and out a little bit. But um, but I think I got the most of that. So, um, so Eric, when we... When, Debbie mentioned use cases. So, you know, situations in which this comes into play. Now, your company specifically, um, you guys are actually working on, um, which is, help explain it to me because I, I you know, I kind of read through some of it. And this is a thought that I'd had in my brain that I don't know how to put together any, any of this technology. But, you know, when it comes to credit modeling, for example, you know, within the mortgage space, credit is obviously a big player. Um, we're looking at people's credit to determine their level of qualification and if they fit. And I had always thought once I kind of got the idea of what blockchain was, is that, you know, how far away are we from me as an individual owning my own credit? Meaning I don't need Equifax, TransUnion, or Experian to me, for me to present to a, a potential lender my viability as a borrower. Because if I have all of my 
you know, uh, personal transactions on my bank account, if I have all my payment history, if I have all my assets all on my own personal blockchain that I choose to share, or give a key to for a potential lender, then to me, like that's the ultimate freedom right there, because now I don't have to worry about mistakes. I don't have to worry about, you know, somebody trying to steal. I mean, I know there's obviously there could be issues down the road, but you guys aren't doing that necessarily, but you're working in that direction. I feel like with what you're doing with, I think it's called passport and, and Ricky, is that right? Correct. So um, empowering the consumer with their data so they can have virtual credit is, is what we're doing. So yeah. if you take aside and we were talking about this pre-call, you know, we live in a Web2 world, which is basically read and write in social media platforms. So you have email, you have texting, you have social media. That's how we share and distribute information. And when we're doing a lot of that, it's done through the Internet, which is which is open source. So, you know, the ultimate goal is when you when we think a step beyond that uh, into an open protocol where you have participants in payments and lending and regulation. And at the center of all that is the individual. It's you. It's it's me. It's Debbie. It's it's all of us where um, this, this there's a, a, a term coined June of last year by Jack Dorsey, who's um, Twitter the CEO started. and founder. Yeah. He was Twitter. Now it's block. He was also square. Mm -hmm. um, but it's called block. And, um, you know, what we're doing is, is, is basically working down that path of we're not changing it. We're basically augmenting and allowing the consumer to control the use of their data, the sharing of their data and the, mon the monetization of their data. So when a qualified borrower is, is providing their bank account information and transaction data, Ricky is the intelligence that sits on top of that direct source data direct from my bank account. So we know it's accurate data, right? right. So the intelligence that comes on, and, and this has been learned through many years of working with regulators, that there's a lot of questions that come into models. There's a lot of models out there. Some work well, some don't work well. Uh, and it's hard to determine when it's a black box. So what we've chosen to do is, and this has been worked on for many, many years over a decade, is go down that path of artificial intelligence that's not machine learning. Go down that AI path that's using, utilizing linguistics and mathematically determining a bar, a, a, someone's ability to pay based off cash flow, discretionary. I, we can see rent histories that are coming in there. You can see if it's eight months checks and three Venmos and one PayPal. The, the linguistics will pick all that up. And you it removes the, the gibberish. You see all of it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we're not saying get rid of FICO. We're saying FICO is great that you're in debt. And how did you handle that debt? Yeah. What yeah. we're saying well, I'm is. I'm saying get rid of FICO. <laughs> no. <laughs> but we're saying let's, what's the holistic view and true ability to pay of a consumer? Well, this is it. If you're looking yeah. at assets and you're looking at how you handle debt together, and now you tokenize that, we call it a medallion, right? So we all have our own medallions that we will then share into a exchange where the lenders can say, I like that medallion, but I didn't know that it was Debbie Hoffman or Mike Mills or Eric Lappin or Shaquille O'Neal or Juan Lopez. Right. You don't know. You just know, all right, I see the soft score. I see the Ricky. They've got a positive cash flow. So it's 120 Ricky. Um, I like I like this deal. I'm gonna I'm gonna present an offer now. And now me as the consumer can say, all right, I got a couple offers here. I like the one from Mike. I'm gonna go with Mike. Now I then send my information. The PII is now sent and now we're doing business together and it's for that permissible use. So everything's permissible use. It's owned and possessed and shared by me, the consumer. And this is for not just mortgage. This is going to be for any loan. So any yeah. credit, you may be approved for 500,000, but I want, I'm going to do 40,000 for this Toyota 4Runner. I'm going to get you know a business loan of 100 grand because I want to start this. It's virtual credit. So it's almost like a debt marketplace to some extent is what you're thinking, where I can go in and say, I want to, I'm, I'm looking for this much in a loan or I'm, I'm able to take this much in additional debt. And then where I want to allocate that to based off of the different lenders that present offers to some extent, is that what you're looking at? Right. And, and, but when you deal with a consumer, it's, they don't need to know all the underneath of all this, sure. right? We're yeah, not yeah. going to, so we're and, B2B to see people and we've realized it's just get loan. That's yeah. it. All right. For what? But Eric, How much? That took. That token is a block is essentially a, a blockchain token. I mean, I just want our listeners to understand the why it's so important that that yeah. token is built on the blockchain, right? Yeah. So yeah, so the the identity um, uh, from that, and there's various vectors of data that are utilized, but you know that digital ID or DID, it's called, mm -hmm. uh, is anchored on the chain. Yeah, but it can be sent in any format: traditionally, uh, Neo, blockchain. 
whatever the 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 end is going to mm. be used is we can do that and really it's just it's, it's basically cryptographically issued loan officers that is going to be generated from a consumer app that the consumer says i want a loan yeah. Well, I think the thing that the consumers struggle with, and and it's again, it's it's there's some irony to it, is that crypto, blockchain, all of this um, takes the the people's security of their data, which has been such a major yeah. uh, concern for people over the last several years, especially mm -hmm. you know after all the WikiLeaks stuff, and you know everybody's like, I want my information, I don't want Facebook selling my information, I don't want Twitter selling, my, I want to control it myself, I want control right. of my own data, right? It's been a big a big trigger for a lot of people these days. And I, I don't think people miss that, but what they miss is that this technology is exactly, can be exactly that where you control your data, you control who has access to it, you control who sees it. And yeah. it makes the privacy sector much or the privacy aspect of what every person tries to wants to live their life under much more attainable because now you control your data because I mean, look, the internet's awesome. Like we, you can't say that because, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we're not better off than we were 20 years ago. Now there's, we have new problems. We have new issues, you know, um, the access to information at the tip of your fingers is fantastic, but now you got to sift through information to figure out what's true and what's bullshit. You know, you got to go through both and that can be a struggle, but you know, the, the, your own personal information, I think is something that Again, there's an irony in that people don't understand blockchain, but they're so concerned about their personal data. And yet those two things solve those problems. So, or that solves that problem. So Debbie, from your point of view, you'd mentioned NFTs before we came on yeah. um, and, and, and kind of chatted about that. Why do you think, in, you specifically, you said a lot of people that you're dealing with always relate NFTs to art, which obviously right. that's a use right. case of it, but you know, there's so much more to it. So right. explain a little bit of that and you know what an NFT is and, and, and tell people about what other things can be used for so they have a better understanding of that. So let, let's just, it's a, it's basically a mint, a, a mint of particular um, information of a, at a particular period of time. And people think about that more about a, uh, a, a mint of a painting or something that happens in sports and very, something very specific at one period of time. But if you look at it from a lending perspective, Think about it from a loan and all the information that's going in one particular loan at one particular time. And if you put that in an M NFT, that can be exchanged. So um, it's just a different use case. And it's a use case that has an, a practical application as opposed to, you know, a, a lot is just more the art is fun and it's ownership of things, but it's ownership of something that represents something else. Whereas if you do it in lending, it's ownership. It's a token. It's an ownership of something that has meaning on the kind of on the market. Yeah. Well, and that's where the digital wallets come into play. And I think, again, you know, once you get into the world a little bit and you start digging through it, you start learning these things. Me personally went through this experience, but, you know, the, under the understanding of the hot and cold storage, you know, where do I keep these NFTs? Where do I keep my tokens? Where do I keep yeah. my data? Um, and whether it's just a, you know, a housing mechanism that you have through your, through your web server, through your phone, or if it's an actual physical, you know, device that you can plug into your computer and, and upload data when you choose to or not. But again, that extra, that just adds to an extra layer of security and in the lending world because i mean it's a one of the questions that i get asked every single time i talk to a borrower when we do pre-qualifications when i ask them to send me their data you know especially if they're you know it's a little bit better for the wrong reasons for the younger generation because the younger generation is like sure here you go because in their mind everybody already has my stuff anyway mm -hmm. so who cares you know it doesn't matter but if i'm talking to someone over the age of say like 50 then it becomes well is your network secure? I mean, can I can I print these off and mail them to you? I'm like, you're going to stick them in the mail? I mean, my email's secure, I promise. So That's it's right. it's one of those things where it's a big concern for consumers because they're so worried about people stealing their information, stealing their data, but yet the tool that's available, that the technology is fully vetted and works right now, that solves all those problems, the adoption of it is so incredibly low, especially in our world. Yeah. Eric, do you think that has more to do with regulation? Do you think it has more to do with ignorance? Do you think, I mean, what, what, why is it that we can't get this thing across the finish line? I think it's a lot of it, but at the top of it, I'm going to go with what Debbie said. The media puts so much in our head and they, and they, they scare a lot of people with <laughs> Sam Bakeman freed is what I hear about from people still. Bernie Madoff was doing the stuff prior to blockchain. Right. It was fraudulent with fiat currency and paper stuff. Right. And, yep. and, and, typing out statements from his, you know, IBM from 1986 or whatever it was. But I mean, <laughs> but 89% of consumers agree that they want to own their financial data and they should be able to have control of that and who has access to it. Yeah. So when you're talking about data, 
from the receiving end of, of the creditor, the lender, or the payment provider, as long as that data is direct from the source, and in our case, it's direct from the bank accounts that or, you know, the consumer logs in and grants that access, yep. then you know that the intelligence on top of that will be made off of direct source data and not data that's incorrect, which we, yep. we deal with still today a lot in the mortgage industry. Um, you know, and the other thing is, you know, we're really in the, we're in the fourth industrial revolution right now. And it's, it's, uh, if you look up fourth industrial revolution, it's really the disruptiveness of technology. It's the use of artificial intelligence. And I do think we're going to need regulation on how that's being used. I believe it can be used as great tools, not as replacements. We're just going to reallocate what people do. Um, certain things will be able to do more. I think you're going to see a lot with consumer engagement. You're going to see a lot with security. You're going to see a lot with um, relationship type of roles as opposed to the staring and comparing stuff that we've seen for a long time. Debbie, um, you, I saw uh, a post recently, you're, you're part of, or at least you're going to the mortgage collaborative soon. Yeah, that's right. right. This weekend. Yeah. Um, so uh, my CEO for our company, her name's Kate Decay. She's a uh, part of the mortgage collaborative. And I think she actually, you're on the, um, it, it, forgive me because I've never gone to these things, but it's like the board for emerging technologies within the industry or what, what's it called specifically? So there's an emerging tech fund. Yes. Um, I'm not on it. I'm not on the fund. I'm a judge for that. So they have a pitch competition, which yes. is amazing for new technology and that can be adopted by um, the industry. And I can tell you more. Do, yeah, can I, please. Can I, mm -hmm. So basically the fund is, is a collaborative, the, the mortgage, the TMC, the uh, mortgage collaborative is a um, collaborative of, uh, not small to mid-sized mortgage lenders who want to be able to have the benefits of basically competing against the larger lend yeah. the lenders. The big and boys, so yeah. this fund was formed so that they can almost sandbox um, in innovative technology together because they can't necessarily, you know, Wells Fargo might have its own sandbox to be able to look at blockchain and figure out where can we use this in mortgage lending, whereas the mortgage collaborative, the fund can, um, can invest in these new technologies and determine um collectively, whether it's something that might um, be able to be useful to all of them. And so what's really great about it is this pitch competition is going to showcase these various um, companies and what they're doing. And I think, yeah, it's great to know um, whether it works or not. It's also great to be able to get the juices flowing on what else can we do. And so just by having people be exposed to this is a great thing for the mortgage industry. So when you, uh, you just said what we can do. So that's kind of the next place I want to go with a little, we, we know a little bit right now that, you know, the, these, these technologies exist, they are functional. They are, have been demonstrated to work and have uses and have very yeah. effective uses, but the adoption is the issue that we're dealing yeah. with right now, which, you know, like you said, you started your company, whatever it was seven years ago, and you're like, we're five years from it. And here we are still struggling to yeah. get people to take it under control or, uh, taken under adoption. But so Eric, from what you're seeing, are you seeing, what do you think like the next, you know, within the next five or 10 years that we're actually going to see direct impacts to real estate and mortgages specifically when it comes to blockchain or what type of either companies or technologies or use cases really that we can have that are directly applicable that will actually start to impact, especially on the, you know, real estate agent, mortgage lender, mm -hmm. you know, level that level, not necessarily the secondary guy who's dealing in capital markets and working to sell his, you know, his, his mortgages to, to this investor and buy them. But, but the individual that's, you know, on the ground, boots on the ground working in the industry, when are we going to start to see that kind of impact hit us? Um, I, I think we're seeing it now and I think it's going to be quicker. So the, the five to seven years Debbie talked about, has seemed like a very long time, but I think the next five, we're going to see more advancement mainly because of the sharing of information, the better security, yeah. um, the knowledge that I think people are, I know you mentioned earlier, Mike, that you're still getting those questions and I do too, but it's getting to the point where people are really starting to, they're going to have to do some research on their own, ask people that are, that are experienced in that area, say, what should I really know? How does this affect me? How does it affect the greater good? And, yeah. you know, there's some things like conscious capital that we were chatting about that, um, you know, there's 50 million um, people with low or no FICO in the United States. There's a third of the workforce in the United States will be Hispanic Americans by 2030. And, and you know, 25% of Hispanic Americans and 30% of, of African Americans feel they never had a good chance to build credit. And democratization of data especially in financial services, 
is is empowering the consumer, but it is also going to help the loan officer. It's going to help the real estate agent. You know, for years I've been talking about disintermediation of the real estate agent. Um, there's a lot of value to a real estate agent, especially for first time home buyer and for those moving out of state and for people that are just not familiar with all the legalities and process. Um, so I think they're just going to be better informed on how to work with a customer to explain to them that, you know, if you share your information, your approval can go quicker by about 20 to 30 days. Here's why. Yeah. Um, you're going to be asked for less documents. It's going to be less painful for you to have to attach PDFs. Number three, if you live in an area that has a digital title plant or e-recording options, you know, it's going to be a lot quicker. You can do it by uh, a camera and you can do you could do it all by digital should you choose to do that. So, And this will help with cost too because you know, the, one of the bigger issues obviously we're dealing with right now is home prices are through the roof and interest rates are much, elevate, or much more elevated and high, higher than they were. So that's creating an issue with people's affordability. But if we can make the process of getting the loan um, smoother and more efficient, then that would reduce costs, yes? Agree. So you yeah. would have at least some reduction. In, yeah, Debbie. Yeah, I just want to say we actually also have come a long way in all this from post pandemic because because there's more of an acceptance of the electronic delivery of things. So, you know, pre pre pandemic, how many states allowed, um, notar you know, just take notarization as an example yeah. to be electronic. So I, I, when we talk about the, six, you know, seven years pre to now and how slow we've moved, a, a lot of it is because the regular the regulations really a lot because of the pandemic have helped us kind of move at a little bit of a faster pace going forward. I think that's, that's my explanation of it too. So, um, we have somebody here in Texas. I'm actually going to, he's going to, uh, be on my podcast in two weeks. Um, his name's Lee Bratcher. He's with the Texas blockchain council, yeah. which yeah. is, um, they're a big advocate in Texas, which I love for, mm -hmm. uh, with, with the, with the state government on coming through and figuring out regulations that they can put in play to start making Texas one of the leaders and moving in that direction. Like that's what we're trying to get to. And, and I love it. And, you know, I've been to a couple of their meetings and, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled that we have somebody in our state that's advocating for this, but, yeah. um, and either one of you can answer this one, but you know, how much do you think the, you know, I call them the, you know, the legacy financing system or what, what was the word you used earlier, Eric? The, Trad TradFi. TradFi, yeah, yeah. yeah, traditional financing. How much of the old school boys club, you know, whatever that that's been existing in this world for a long time is literally fighting against this whole application or this whole um, adoption of it? Because again, if we're talking about giving people the freedom to own their information, we're talking about keeping finance decentralized. So that way there's not one entity that's controlling access to this or, or making the marketplace. I mean, it's the most capitalistic thing that could possibly exist where you're opening up the market to anybody that can participate. And yet all the legacy companies that have been around for a long time, the big banks, the, you know, the black rocks of the world, although, you know, I know they're filing ETFs and all that, but that's just the way to control it. But at least in my opinion, <laughs> what is it? I mean, is that, I mean, am I being conspiratorial here or is there a concerted effort to keep this out? And, and either one of you can take that. Um, I'll take first. I think that this is where we're, we're talking about your, this is where you're seeing the open network, open source approach to looking at decentralized finance, but with a centralized finance regulatory control on it. You can mm -hmm. have CFI meets DeFi. Okay. Centralized meets decentralized. Yeah. Yeah. So the technology piece can be decentralized. Possession and control of the consumer based off of source data, not just the data that we're doing here, but any data, any data that is going to be utilized uh, and permissioned by the borrower can be used in any decisioning. And this is for the lending piece. When you get into the payments piece, you know, you're already seeing, you brought up FedNow a little bit earlier. Um, you know, we're really seeing that a, a lot of money movement is going to be, it, it's already, it's, it's, it's here to stay. And that's the thing. As far right. as those that are afraid of it, I think it's, there's a couple reasons for that. I don't think it's conspiracy with what you're saying at all. I think it's just more of, it creates competitive markets, data sovereignty, the network effects are there. Um, you already have personal data, entity data, um, institutions, regulatory, all working with one another. If you have a shared framework of how to do this and the regulatory bodies are involved, um, I, th I think it, it works very well. It's just you now have pathways that are digitally storing that data and it's immutable and it helps with audit trails because we get in trouble when we have audit problems. Yeah. 
Debbie? Yeah, just that 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 last point brings me to that we want to make sure people understand what you were just saying. So with um with a blockchain, you can have an, all these different nodes and different um I guess peepholes into what is on the chain. So yeah. think about a regulator who could have a node and could be able to see certain aspects. I'm not saying everything. And so when they when they do audits, instead of having to take all your information and all, I, again, taking it from a, uh, a mortgage loan perspective and having to take um, a whole sampling of loans and putting them in a room and putting a regulator in the room and being able to look at certain things, the concept here is that they could have um, real-time direct access to specific things within your, you know, within your books and records mm -hmm. uh, on the blockchain. I am I making sense? So I just, yeah, you know, I yeah. just want to bring that point forward. Yeah, no, you're saying that you can grant them access to specific parts of it. It doesn't have to be all of your data. It can be some of your data and they can get yeah. into it and still do an audit, whether it's a company or an individual or whatever the case may be. They yeah. have You can grant access to it without having to compromise the entire data set, right? So right. And so having a regulator be able to do that is huge because you're not, I mean, it's just, it's, it's authenticity, it's real time. It's um, so it, it will help with audit trails tremendously. Well, and that's where, again, that's where I, I struggle sometimes because knowing what I know, you know, and it's limited, but knowing what I know about all this technology, it seems pretty evident. I mean, it wasn't even, I don't know what y'all's situation was when you first got into it, but, you know, I, I kind of started dipping my toe into it right before the pandemic hit. And then kind of, especially during that period of time, because we all had a bunch of time on our hands. Um, <laughs> I was, I was going through and, you know, going to YouTube university and all this stuff. And what, what hit me right away was the, the, uh, the functionality of it. It was, it, there wasn't even a, you know, sometimes you read stuff, you're like, eh, it doesn't make any, let me dig a little further. I mean, it was immediate. I was like, absolutely. Okay. I, I get it. You have multiple servers that can all control the data in order to be, go back and change it. You have to hit all those servers, which makes it nearly impossible to make it corruptible. So now yeah. you have this, this technology that makes something completely, almost completely secure. And so yeah. the applications for that are, are mind boggling. There's so many things that you could do with it. And yet here we are, you guys have been in it for 10 years and we're still at a point. And I know at some higher levels, they are certainly starting to implement it, but I just can't wrap my head around the fact of why we haven't further moved. I mean, there are companies like I'm, I'm talking to another guy in a couple of weeks um, that's doing fractionalization of uh, property, Real, right? So, yeah. So their company right now, and this is, you know, for anybody who doesn't know how this works, uh, you buy a, it, this is primarily being used more so in commercial properties, but you are yeah. seeing some residential, you buy a resident or a commercial apartment complex, warehouse, whatever it is. Um, you transfer the title of that property into an LLC, and then you tokenize or fractionalize mm -hmm. the LLC and then sell off the token. So you can buy a piece of a commercial building for a hundred dollars. If you want, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you earn a dividend. It might be a nickel, but you're going to earn a dividend off of that. You're in the game. You're, you're in the, in game, the game, game of generating some additional income and assets. That's and right. And then when you sell it, life. you get the benefit from it. So yeah. So what, tell me about that, Eric. Yeah. So fra fractionalization, I love it. I mean, you're, what you're doing, like you said, is, is you're taking an asset and it's done a lot on the commercial real estate side where an LLC yeah. is set up and it allows tens or hundreds of individuals who have LLCs to come in and, and partake in that investment. And yeah. that is also um, another example of the tokenization of that too. Where well, you're it opens have up so much liquidity now because you have yeah. so many people that are, are capable. If I don't have, if I want, if I don't wanted to be a part of a syndicate, I've got to put up fifty, a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars in order to be an investor in that. But if I want to buy a token on a fractionalized property. I could do it for 50 bucks. I could do it for a hundred. Right. I could do it for a thousand. So now just like what Robin hood kind of did for stocks where they yeah. fractionalized stocks where you could purchase mm -hmm. it with pennies. That's what these companies are doing for real estate, which I think is fantastic. Correct. But again, it's, they're struggling with the same thing you guys are is the education of the investor as to, okay, how does this work and why is it secure and all that? So, you know, right. we are seeing it creep into certain spots of our industry that are starting to kind of slowly move in those adoption and that adoption option range, but then you run into the issues with regulators and what they're allowing and what they're not. And that's where I struggle with understanding why, if this technology is so useful and is, I mean, it works. It, it's not like we're testing it still, right? <laughs> I mean, it works. So why is the adoption so slow from the big boys? You want to know why I think it is? Oh, yeah. Ahead, Dobby. Uh, I just want to real quick, I want to add on fractionalization. It also allows for a lot of foreign investment. And yes. I, I, I would say it's almost like akin to crowdfunding property, the way you would crowdfund an investment. Yes. But but the maybe the downside, and Eric, we'll, 
I want to hear your opinion on why, but maybe um, you can't move into your commercial space when you buy into a fraction, you know, a real yeah. estate through fractionalization. You're just owning a, a, a yeah. piece of something. So yeah, but I can't, go, I can't go talk on the, I can't have an opinion on the Apple board of directors because I own 500 stocks in Apple. So I mean, it's the same yeah. thing. It's not yeah, any yeah. different. Yeah, you're right. Okay. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not solving home ownership. That's yeah. still no. an issue here for oh, years. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, it, it does help with assets that can be accumulated by those that couldn't afford the whole the, right. the whole thing at once. Right. The, one of the reasons why I think it's slow, or there's a couple, is whenever there's competitive markets that are created, there's always a group that doesn't want competitive markets. That's right. Mm -hmm. And yes. when the competitive market is coming into play with this, we also have to think about it from the government and whether you like government or not, whether you're, whatever your belief is, there has to be some sort of regulatory body to make sure that, that we stay in a lane of some sort. Yeah, there's gotta be rules to the game. There's gotta there be, has rules. to be rules. Yep. We, we've proven as humans, we can't, if we don't have yellow dotted <laughs> lines, people will be all over the road. We can't do Absolutely. That. So I really think it comes down to when there's gonna, I think there's gonna be another regulatory body created with people from other regulatory bodies that are gonna then manage this digital currency space really understanding what is the value of a stable coin and really understanding which blockchains are being conducted and, and, and producing a product that's being done legally. And then lastly, the government's got to be able to find it and tax it. Right. Yeah. And when they could do all that, then they'll come out with it. And I think they're getting there now to the point where they, I think a lot of them understand. And I learned this at a, at a recent um, event I was at last week that, You've got a lot of very, very smart people that were traditional finance that are also in decentralized finance and some big, big name global companies were there. And they were saying, we're getting to that point where I think we're going to have something drawn out here probably by 2024. But I think it's going to be for the betterment of all because it's going to really help society and help the underbanked and the underserved and allow those that were usually invisible to now become invisible in these markets yeah. um, that were never seen before. So yeah. I think it's... If it's if it's done the right way, you can have data sovereignty and the control and use of that data back in the hands of us. Well, and and I'm glad you said it. if it's done the right way, because I'm with you, man. Regulation is it makes it to where it the mass adoption of it makes it much easier, right? That's one of the when we were before we came on, you brought up um, Ripple, uh, which is you know they've been in uh, the milk, how long, is it, plant is based it, milked. I was what's that? About I was talking about the plant-based milk. Right? Yeah, but uh, but I mean, the company I Ripple. I was, I <laughs> but I mean, they've been in. Is it three years now with the SEC that they've been in this this litigation with them on on? Uh, and I don't right. even know the exact. You know, at this point, what exactly they're dealing with about the security versus you know what what they're defining themselves as. But I'm all for regulation. And but what you said of when it's done the right way and the problem sometimes that we run into with regulation and which I think you know easy transition. This is, this is what's happening. I think with AI right now, to some extent is yeah. there's a big push in Washington to get AI regulated because they don't, they say they don't want some, you know, crazy person, you know, building some sentient AI in their, you know, in their garage mm -hmm. and then figuring out how to make a weapon or whatever. Right. And I understand that argument hundred percent, but the problem is, is that the regulation also then centralizes who has control over those technologies. Because if with AI, for example, if the federal government says that I have to have a particular license and I have to be either Google or uh, Amazon or one of these ma massive companies in order to be able to develop this technology, well, that takes the little guys and kicks sure. them all out. Yeah. So if you take that same application and you move it over to blockchain and you say, okay, well, you can develop your own blockchain or you can develop your own data service or you can develop your own you know, uh, coin or whatever the case may be but you have to have this much money or you have to apply for this application, you know, then it starts to, it starts to shrink the field. And so then it makes it really challenging for the small upstarts to come in and do this. And the great thing about web three as a whole is that it is, it is what we experienced in the nineties with the internet, because it allowed companies like Facebook and Google and Amazon mm -hmm. to come out of nowhere, essentially in this new technology and develop these Titans that are now running our world. Right. Well, yeah. the same thing I think is very, very, likely when you look at web three and AI that the companies that start now and have the most impact immediately, it always centralizes. But at this point, you know, I don't want the game getting rigged, you know, as, as the, as the world moves into these, into this direction to where we're stuck, we're limiting it to only a select few that have money to play in the game. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. I mean, 
Mike, I want to, again, take a branch off of what you're talking about in terms of regulation. What we're seeing now so much is regulation by enforcement actions. Um, so I think for a long time, the, the pattern that I've noticed is so we didn't know. We kept saying we need some regulation or we're just, you know, the companies are going to move outside of the U.S. And now we're seeing, OK, the U.S. actually the regulators do understand this and they have lots of expertise. And I recently heard somebody, um, one of the um, agencies talk about how many on staff they had and it was phenomenal how many they have educated in this, these specific areas and so but what they're doing is more than lawmaking is enforcement action and what enforcement action does is it makes like you can't prepare for that because you don't know what it is and so you know the, the greatest example we saw this i guess it was this spring early summer was in coinbase and where they had said they had had a a request is this okay and then instead of getting an answer they the, the sec went after them so um, we'll see. I mean, it needs to it needs to flatten out a little bit, and enforcement is 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 not the best way of regulation. Yeah, well, because that costs you money to play the game, and if you don't have enough money to sustain Correct. that, I mean, That's it's like you know, yeah. Chase Bank, yeah. for example. You know, I was laughing the other day because, and, and we deal with the big banks all the time, and you know what they impact on our small business. But, um, you know, Chase Bank was fined. I think it was, I'm going to get the numbers wrong. I did a thing on it a little while ago, but let's just say it was, you know, $25 million because they deleted, you know, it was something like a hundred thousand emails that got moved off of, and there were seven, you know, federal investigations in for different reasons that needed access to those emails. And yeah. they completely deleted them and were like, oops, you know, this company we hired, they got rid of a sorry. Right. And then they paid their $25 million. Mm -hmm. right? yeah, appreciate right. it. You know, right. so they can do that kind of thing uh -huh. because they're sitting on massive amounts of cash, but the little guy that's trying to start his, you know, his, his blockchain yeah. in his garage or his, you know, little AI bot that he's worked on his computer. He has no yeah. shot because if the yeah. federal government comes in and then says these they can't pay that i mean there's no right. way to do it. you know so right. it's this it's this world where we are we are in a place where you know generational wealth could certainly be created for a lot of people you know in the next the gen z's and the millennials of the world that are are moving or growing up with this technology and knowing how to use it knowing how to move forward with it but we have to exist in a place where we can also you know have regulation because it is important and it, and it brings adoption to the table but also yeah. make regulation to where it's it's reasonable right because mm -hmm. you know it look you know i don't mean to whatever but you know marijuana regulation is a good example of this right when you look at different states that wanted to legalize the sale of marijuana colorado was the initial one and they they made licenses available to pretty much anyone. You had to apply for it. You had to get certain, you know, had to meet certain restrictions, but it wasn't limited. Well, then you go to a state like, I don't know, it may have been in Ohio, but um, where they were trying to pat the, the, the Nick Lachey, the guy that was from like 98 degrees in the, in yeah, the yeah. 90s, you know, the nineties or whatever. Um, yeah. I can't remember. It was like Michigan or somewhere in the, in the Midwest. Um, they were trying to pass it as well, but their, their legalization of it in that state limited it to like 20 licenses. There was only 20 that were going to be granted and there 15 of them had already been mm. basically spoken for. Well, the people spoke and they voted that bill down. So it, you know, to the country, it looked like, Oh, they don't want to legalize it. But to the state, they were like, no, 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 we want to legalize it, but we want to, we want people to have access to it and people to be able to do and not just limit it to a few. And that's what I fear a little bit in this, in this industry with, with blockchain and with AI is that this technology that's emerging that the people that are in those legacy systems that have the cash are going to create rules to where unless you have the money to participate in the game, then you're not invited to the table. Right. You know what I mean? And it was Ohio. It was Ohio. Okay. Yeah. yeah sorry. I'm, my memory, you know, slips on that stuff. <laughs> so, um, all right. Speaking specifically, so Eric, you said you, you brought up a term, we kind of explained it a minute ago, but I want you to dig a little bit deeper into the whole web five idea, because I know what web three is. Um, and you can even say, hey, here's what web two is. Here's what web three is. Cause I still, again, people don't know blockchain. They probably don't know mm -hmm. what we're talking about when we say web two, three and five. So give me a little bit of context to that. Yeah, it's, um, it's a, it's a, term coined by Jack Dorsey last summer. Uh, I encourage everyone to Google that, Jack Dorsey Web Web 5. But if you, if you realize, and, and Jack Dorsey is fascinating. There's a webcast uh, or, a, or a podcast um, with him just recently on uh, Spotify I just listened to. And, you know, what's great about him is at the crux of everything he talks about, and the reason why he went from Web 2 to Web 3 and skip 4 and just call it 5. Where's the 4? Yeah, there's no four because it was, it's it's, it's basically taking the web two, which is the information of the email and the text, 
yeah. texting and the social media that we're used to. Yeah. Now you go to Web3 where you now have um, the, you know, the tokenization and now that augmentation of the use of that data. And then they add what Web2 and Web3 together and call it Web5. Yeah. And Web5 just simply says possession and the control of the consumer or the individual. And it's really a, not a, that's a term that Jack Dorsey coined. But the idea is really from 2012, a book that I read years ago called The Intention Economy. And Doc Searles is the author of that. And it says putting the commoditization back to the consumer where the corporations don't control what they do or how they do it or how they share it. So it's, yeah. it's been around a while, but now we have, we have the intelligence to do it. We have the data, we have the technology. And by moving more towards open source type of doing business, which is really what the internet is, that, that helped the entire world become connected. Yep. Businesses spawned up from it. Information was being shared. So you know, think about privacy, security, fair value exchange, a competitive marketplace, earning referral fees, and most importantly, financially underserved and underbanked that are becoming visible. That's what we're, I think all of us on this call and a lot of people in our industry are trying to solve, which we can. It's here today. We can do it. I think it really just comes down to, as you said earlier, Mike, that what's holding groups back from really accepting this? Some of it has to really be from the people that don't like it to really understand why don't they understand it or why don't they want to understand it? Yeah. Is it self-preservation on a job? Is it saying, well, I don't want to do this. It's too efficient. I won't make money anymore. That's never a way to have anything for betterment of society and the greater good. There's always ways to earn income. It's just a different way of doing it and you make it more inclusive for everyone. So I think eventually... I think very quickly we're going to see some movement with the regular uh, regulators. Uh, and I'd like to ask this to Debbie, but with, with all the work that you've been doing and, and working as the professor and, and teaching the classes that you do, um, have you learned from any case uh, studies just even in 22 and 23 mm -hmm. where we're starting to see the use of um, ethical artificial intelligence and the use of mm -hmm. data that is actual source data to determine some sort of, decisioning instead of worrying about, well, can I trust it? Well, you don't have to trust data that's direct from the source. It's the truth. So throw that away. That's, that's what's called zero knowledge proof. That's a whole nother thing. Right. right. Eric, yeah, we everybody need a whole... has their own truth, Eric. Everybody has their own yeah, yeah. truth. Right? <laughs> we yeah. need a whole other hour for that because right. uh, yeah, there's so much to talk about there, but it's, it's kind of a so Give me one topic. Yeah. 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 We, well, I do want to, can I reiterate my, yes, that just please. like so much of this also, as Eric was saying, is in, it's information for the, on, there's there's ways to help the unbanked and the migrant worker and all of that through use of blockchain and use of um, whether it's types of cryptocurrency or tokenization. Because be, uh, you know Eric talked about so much of it in in his, in the product that he's um, you know that his company's working on, but there's so many more use cases there, and I think that's another really intriguing topic when it comes to real estate and finance. Yes, I, I think the um, the the access to this type of stuff for individuals that, you know, especially, I think you're going to see it more and more. And I think we already are um, globally, maybe before it gets mm -hmm. to the U S because we have these, you know, legacy systems in place already. But I use the example a lot of times because you know, blockchain essentially what it can ultimately do is cut out the middleman. It can take yeah. the, the, the third party intermediary that has all the technology and services back and forth between the, the you know, the, end user and the, you know, the, the customer, and it kind of eliminates that piece because, you know, it's, I, I use the example of uh, like a, a villager in Afghanistan, right. That we, mm -hmm. you know, the country's ripped to shreds, you know, there's all kinds of stuff going on, but he has a phone, right. And, yes. and on his phone, he can have access to a web wallet that he can put yes. his crypto in. And then yes. if he wants to sell his herd of goats to the villager mm -hmm. across the street. They don't need to have Bank of America in between right. them to transact. He can send right. directly from his wallet to his wallet. Now they need a currency that they can both trust, right? Yeah. That, that they yeah. both can use and spend in different ways. But at the end of the day, you know, they have something that they can both rely on and and and, and they don't need a middle party. And I think that's part of the reason 
that there has been the pushback is just because there are services, like you said, Eric, that are going to be eliminated to some extent. And people fear losing their job or losing their money or losing what they do. But just like anything else, you know, when when the electric when the electric light bulb became a thing, the guys that were lighting up all the lamp posts and the guys that were you know riding their horses and and putting out the the candles at night, you know, they all got jobs and they figured yeah. out ways to do something different. Now, I do think we have to do a better job as a country and and maybe state wide to help people when they're in a transition period, if their industry is starting to take a turn, you know, and see, okay, how do we, how do we educate people in new types of careers and new types of skill sets? Mm -hmm. And, th and I think that's the biggest solution to all of this is more of what you guys are already doing out there, which I think is great, which is where I found you where you're out there talking to people, educating them on the process or educating them on the technology and what all's involved. So that yeah. way people understand it. And when they understand it, the fear of it starts to go mm -hmm. away. And, yeah. and that's why I wanted to have you all on is because I do feel like there's so many applications and it gets hard because even like when Eric starts talking to him and going through <laughs> what's, happening, what's happening, like I'm sitting here going, man, I don't, I don't understand half of that, but okay. I mean, it sounds good. You know, yeah. so with my tiny brain, like I'm still trying to wrap around all this stuff, but I think what y'all are doing right now, which is, you know, putting the word out there and helping people better start at a basic level. You know, when I do loans, it's loans are not complicated. They're really pretty simple, but People don't do it every day. And so when they talk to me and they only buy one or three or four houses in their life, I've got to break down every single step of mm -hmm. the process to this is how payments work. This is how your interest rate affects your payment. This is how much money you need, all that kind of stuff. I got to make it as simple as possible because I have to relieve the fear. Once they, yeah. once they have the knowledge and the fear is gone, then they're much you know, much more trustworthy, much easier to work through from the rest of the process. And I think more of what you guys are doing is, is really what we need to have. And, you know, I appreciate y'all, you know, we're, we're almost at an hour here. I appreciate y'all hopping on with me and, and kind of walking through this, but before we go, um, Debbie, is there anything, you know, you would like to kind of leave everybody with and, you know, anything you have upcoming or whatever, but just kind of, you know, where, where are we going to go with this thing? And are it, are we going to, are we going to have this mass adoption in the next 10 years? <laughs> Am I going to be out of a job? Like, how's this going to work? I'm going to, I'm going to encourage everybody to don't walk away from here and be like, I don't understand this and I'm never going to understand it. Right. Start following things, do some reading, follow things on your, on your social media, wherever you have your channels, um, connect with, uh, Eric and me. And of course, Mike, no doubt. And, um, and just continue to educate yourself and eventually it will happen because it's not going away. You can't go backwards from technology. It's only going to go forwards. That's right. Eric. Yep. I think that for everyone that's in real estate and lending, just know that the consumer, especially as the other generations are coming up, are demanding this. Yeah. And because of that, um, adoption happens and scale happens. So, yeah, get educated. Reach out to us. Uh, there's many, many great podcasts and our podcast and uh, articles to read uh, from novice all the way to experienced. And, um, you know. Uh, personally very passionate about change and also the betterment of everyone. And I think that we're, there's more and more people that are getting there and I um, appreciate you having, having us on this call today. Yeah, no, I, I the uh, real quick on the education thing, I'll tell you guys how I got into it is um, I heard about Bitcoin from some, I don't remember how it came across <laughs> my eye. And, yeah. and so I looked at it and kind of did a little bit of digging and, you know, watched some videos or whatever. But what I did was, is I took my money which was, I think at the time I did like a hundred dollars and, and I put a hundred dollars in, I went and opened a Coinbase account and, and bought a hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin. And mm. when you, when you put 50 bucks, 25, whatever it is, when you put a little bit of your money into it, then yeah. you start paying attention because right. now when I checked my account and it was at 125, I was like, what, you know, and then, you know, you right. buy a little more and then you, then I bought some Ethereum and then I started buying, you know, internet computer and all these. So you start going through and, and the crypto, the good thing about crypto, whatever you want to, carry a negative or positive connotation to it is, is that it is a very good avenue for people to get into because if you start doing just a little bit, uh, don't get crazy, okay? Because it's still very speculative and it's very right. new and there's a lot right. of shysters out there. But um, but if you just dip your toe in that water a little bit, you're going to really start 
to consume more and more information because when you have an interest in something and it impacts you, you tend yeah. to learn much, much quicker. And I, and I think that may be a good avenue for people, even though crypto is a scary thing to some folks, but yeah. it is a good place to start to start learning this because that's what opened my eyes up to everything else is just kind of getting in that lane mm -hmm. and then seeing the whole road and being like, oh my gosh, there's so much more to this that you don't even realize. And it's going to revolutionize how we do everything. And at this point, it's just a matter of time, I guess. But um, sure. all right, guys. Well, again, I appreciate it so much um you know thank you I, I don't do three person things very often because you know there's you know i try to get it all within an hour you know most yeah. people listen 30 minutes of it anyway but uh but i do appreciate y'all stopping by and um you know we'll definitely have to do it again i'm going to try to i'm trying to do more and more you know blockchain web3 crypto type podcast because i do think that's where it's headed and you know i think the more i understand it the better i can position myself to still have a job in 10 years so <laughs> oh yeah it, yeah absolutely well, well, thanks, guys. Uh, appreciate y'all stopping by. Thanks for everybody that hung around to the end. And uh, next week, I will have a local realtor on. We'll, we'll get more into real estate stuff, but then go right back into crypto the week after that. So everybody have a good weekend, and we'll see you then. Sounds good. Thanks, thanks Mike. Bye, Debbie. Bye.